morning, everyone. It's really good to have you in worship with us today. Uh, I don't have any particular announcements other than to uh, stay safe in the sun and uh, welcome and invite you to stand for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. We begin this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. from Jeremiah, chapter 23. Jeremiah prophesies before the exile in 587 BCE. In this passage, he uses a metaphor of a shepherd to describe the bad kings who has scattered the flocks of Israel. God promises to gather the flock and to raise up a new king from David's line to save Israel and Judah. Here begins the reading. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnants of my flock out of the lands, where I've driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The words of the Lord. Let us pray responsibly, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want.
You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your namesake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 2. The author of this letter reminds his audience that originally they were not part of God's chosen people. Through Jesus' death, however, they are included in God's household of faith, whose cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Here begins the reading. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is a hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have, ac have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the sixth chapter. When Jesus sends his disciples out to teach and heal, they minister among large numbers of people. Their work is motivated by Christ's desire to be among those in need. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going. They had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise the 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we were reading in Ephesians in the first chapter, and we hit that uh, often commented on verses uh, basically 3 through 14, where Paul launches into a prayer of praise to God. And it is notable for two things. One of them, in 11 verses, he says, in him, or through him, or because of him, or the beloved, 14 times. So when Paul is considering all that's going on in his life and in his ministry, in the lives of the people to whom he's in contact, he is praising God for what God is doing in the Messiah, in Jesus. And he says, in him, in him, in him, in him. And so that really sort of sets the stage for what follows. For some reason, the folks doing the lectionary are skipping over some pretty substantial material and getting to today's reading in the middle of the second chapter. But I wanted to kind of hit some of the highlights of what we're skipping over because I think it makes sense. Paul, after that famous line, uh, 11 verse long line, uh, which by the way, he divides into three points. One of them is about the exodus out of Egypt. Another point is specifically a Passover reference. And the third one is about our inheritance in him. So he finally gets to that characteristic thing in an, in an epistle of Paul where he tells the people how he is praying for them. And Paul's prayer for the Ephesians has to do with them appropriating wisdom and an understanding of the power that is work, at work within them in order for them to live as the disciples of Jesus Christ in the world. And so he's going to visit that business about power uh, fairly solidly. His point is that as human beings, we are born, says the baptismal liturgy, children of a fallen humanity. He takes sin quite seriously. That's something that's maybe not the case in the current environment, but sin is deadly. Sin is separation from God. Sin is more than just, oops, I made a mistake. It is a deadly condition that leads to obliteration. Paul's very concerned about it. And if we really thought about what sin is, we would be as well. We have studied this year, going back to looking at Genesis, the first sin that's recorded in the scripture with Adam and Eve and the, that fall captures the nature of it. They know who God is. They have a very clear word from God. And the choice that the human beings make is, I don't want God to have a say in how I live my life. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. And the consequence of it is ruin. It's death. It's destruction. And there's not a thing that we are able to do to get out of it. So over the centuries, the sages in ancient Israel and in the Christian church have looked at the nature of sin and they realize it's all encompassing and there's uh, no way to avoid it and there's no way to get out of it. And it runs deep in us. It's not just a superficial, um, oops, I made a mistake in judgment. It is a profound rejection of who God is and puts us in a predicament where we're stuck and we can't get out. Um, image that always comes to mind for me, do you remember Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons when you were a kid? It, the bad guy's name was Boris and his girlfriend was Natasha, right? And they were always trying to cause mischief and invariably, Boris would pull out a small black round ball of a thing with a fuse on it called a petard. 
and the fuse was always lit, and somehow or the other, Boris never quite managed to throw the petard before it blew up in his hand. Well, there's a line from Shakespeare about being hoist in your own petard, and that's us. We are, like Boris Badenov, unable to extricate ourselves from our sin and the consequences of them and the death that is on its heels. That's our circumstance. So what's going to happen if it's left up to us, the inevitable? But there's this wonderful phrase, but God, the creator of heaven and earth, looks at the human predicament and has, as we read in the gospel, compassion on them. And for the sake of love, God chooses to intervene. And literally, right from the moment of the human fall, God put a plan in place and put it to work to save not only us, but all of creation. And that plan is planted something like a mustard seed, and it begins to manifest itself with a call of Abram and Ur of the Chaldees to come out and look at the night sky, and he says, go to a land that I'm going to show you. Eventually, Abram turns into Abraham and the promise, and it works itself out slowly through the people of Israel, and you have the whole business of the exile, you have the coming into the inheritance, you have the judges and the kings and the prophets, all of it moving and pointing to a specific moment in time where God himself takes on human flesh and dwells among us as Jesus of Nazareth who shows us the godly life and then goes to the cross where he takes on all of the sins of the world and brings it to one place where he judges it, damns it, carries it to hell, and leaves it. And early on the first day of the week, he rises to new life, and he gives that life to us. And he gives that new life to us complete with his Holy Spirit. So Paul will say in the verses that we skip that we are in him, these new creations. He takes the human condition at that point and shows something else that Jesus is doing. Jesus is not content with the division of the human race brought on by the sin. And so Jesus does something unique. Without taking anything away from the covenant and the people of Israel, he opens all of that up to the Gentiles. And so what happens is that the Holy Spirit is given. As you read through the scriptures, both in the Pauline epistles and then in Acts, during the decade of the 50s, the big fight in the church was how Jewish do you have to be in order to become a disciple of Jesus? And the answer that prevailed was Paul's. Not at all. He makes the point that as a Jew, it wasn't living in and keeping the covenant that brought us to peace with God. It was Jesus and his grace that brought the Jews to peace with God. And so he makes the point with his ministry to the Gentiles, it wasn't circumcision, it wasn't keeping kosher, it wasn't living in the land, it wasn't wearing talif and zitzi and yarmulke and so forth that makes you right with God. It's Jesus who makes you right with God. And so he says, Jesus has made a whole new humanity. The walls are torn down. He uses an example in the epistle lesson, at the temple in Jerusalem, you have to think of it in terms of concentric circles that emanate out from a, a center. The center is the Holy of Holies. And at one point in time, the Ark of the Covenant was in there, and the Shekinah glory of God dwelt over the seat of mercy on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. But there was a veil that blocked entrance into that room in the temple 
Only the high priest could go in there on Yom Kippur with an offering. And God was considered to be so unapproachable and so holy that for a human being to go through that veil risked dying. And there are stories in the scripture of people touching the Ark of the Covenant and falling over dead and so forth. So when the high priest went into that room, he had wore bells sewn onto the hem of his robe and a rope around his foot in case he got struck dead and they needed to get the corpse out. They could just pull him out with a rope. The next room was the holy place where you had the incense altar and the showbread representing the people of Israel and the menorah and so forth. And priests would go in there and change out oil and bread and incense, uh, but it was a restricted area. Move outward again and you get to the court of the Israelite men. And they could go that close to the Holy of Holies and pray. Call to mind, if you see pictures in Israel, you'll find people at the western retaining wall of the temple platform, and they're right up against the wall, and uh, people will write out prayers and stick them in the cracks of the wall, and they, they'll spend time. That's as close as they can get to the Holy of Holies. And actually, if you look running down the length of that wall, there's an archway, and people go all the way to exactly lined up on where the Holy of Holies was located. And there's a synagogue in there where people pray, but that's off camera. So people got that close. There's another courtyard, the court of the Israelite women. And then another courtyard that's the courtyard of the Gentiles. They could go to Jerusalem. They could worship the God of Israel. But there was a wall that went around the, blocking the court of the Gentiles from the court of the Israelite women. And at the gateways through this wall, there were signs that said, if you are a Gentile and you go through this opening, your inevitable death will be on your own head. There's this separation between the people of the covenant on the inside and the rest of humanity on the outside. And so Paul uses that image to say, Jesus has broken down that wall. Jesus has taken those who were on the outside, and through his death and resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit, he has pulled them into the family of God, the household of God. And so there's this new humanity, no longer separated but made one in Jesus Christ. So what are we supposed to learn from what Paul's saying here? I think the first thing is we need to understand the consequences of our sin are significant enough that it causes God Almighty to send his son to die a hideous and painful death on a cross as part of the propitiation of that sin. It's that serious. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, what costs God much cannot be cheap for us. Those sins, though Christ takes them away, the residue of them clings to us in this life. You've heard Lutherans say the one Latin phrase we all learned in seminary, similius et precator. In the same moment, I'm justified before God by Jesus and yet I'm still a sinner. I have these thoughts and inclinations that run from surface level to the very core of my being that want to say, I don't want God to tell me what to do. I want to go my own way. I want to go my own distance. I want to have everything exactly the way I want it without consequences, and I think you ought to affirm it and pay for it. That's kind of the spirit of our age. And that still clings to us. And it will kill us. Yet in Jesus Christ, there is compassion. There is undeserved favor. There is a propitiation for our sin. There is a being made right with God. There is the offer of new life 
there is a way forward that frees us from that thraldom. There is a new exodus made by the new Passover to carry us to the new inheritance in Jesus Christ. That is the dilemma with which we fight every single day. And we're never free from it. And it's a struggle. It's the kind of struggle, to paraphrase Jesus, this is the kind that only comes out by prayer. And so we walk the Christian life in him. And we go forward from there. It's in him that we have the ability to mimic him. Jesus is very busy in the gospel lesson today, and yet his first instinct when he sees the people is to have compassion. That's not my first instinct. Is it yours? In Christ, it becomes our instinct. And Jesus then gets over being tired, and he gets to work. And the first thing that he does is teach them about who God is, about the kingdom of heaven, about how God is in their life. And he does something very practical. He does what he's able to do to heal them. Now that's a lot. He can do anything. And he healed, the text says, all. They only wanted to reach out and touch the fringe of his garment. That act of faith produced healing. Some Christians have the gift of healing. The rest of us have to do things like design institutions and train people to staff them and to resource them and um, to engage by how we spend our life. But that's what we do. So God grant to us Paul's prayer for the people at Ephesus. May we be given this insight into our very spirit that God is in Christ Jesus reconciling the world. May God grant that we appreciate that he has made us members of his household and that we walk that walk in him and we engage in him and we do what we do in him. If we can see that much, the consequences will be huge. Amen.
you to be seated. We have the pleasure this morning of taking a new person into membership. So, this is Michelle. She is married into the Kaufman family that you all know so well. And the Lord laid it on her heart to join us. Woohoo! <laughs> Dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for Michelle Kaufman, one with us in the body of Christ who is making public affirmation of her baptism. Eric, do you want to take the next line? I present Michelle who desires to make public affirmation of her baptism. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for our sister whom you have made your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called them to yourself, enlighten them with the gifts of your spirit, and nourish them in the community of faith. Uphold Michelle in the gift and promises of baptism and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. We are here this morning to welcome this new member into the community of St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church. We are not a building, or a trust fund, but the gathered family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, given this new identity through our baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection. Today we welcome you as a member of this family in the larger body of Christ. And so we ask you, do you desire to join the membership of St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church? I do. We confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we ask you if you would sign right here. And we have a gift for you. Thank you. Welcome. So, one in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we these caps saved land from destruction, like a shepherd tends to her sheep raise up from among us caretakers of all you have made in your mercy for the leaders of nations and heads of tribes where peace seems far off bring it near where justice seems fleeting bring it to light where discord seems relentless bring harmony in your mercy hear our prayer for the health and well-being of family friends and neighbors heal those who are sick especially President Trump, Tiffany, Brad, Rosalind, Corey, Mark, Margie, Bruce, Marty, Donnie, Don, Lori, Josh, Brenda, Larry, Greg, Carson, Nicholas, Cameron, Brady, Wanda, Debbie, Holly, Summer, Jake, Andrew, Carol, Louie, Shim, Joe, Gail, 
Beth and Ken, Kyle and Elena, David, Carol, and Sullivan. Give courage to all who struggle with addiction. Touch with your tender care all who reach out to you in pain. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For this assembly and for the greater Columbia area ministerium, nurture the collaborative partnership of ecumenical churches, faith-based and other community organizations. Break down dividing walls and inspire collaboration to work, worship, and serve and pray together to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ in meeting the needs of the community. In your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for those who have died, make us certain that in Christ we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints in the household of God. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. You reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. give you thanks, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you sent in this end of all the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim to us your will. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you created all things and in whom you take delight. He is your word, sent from heaven to a virgin's womb. He there took on our nature and our lot and was shown forth as your Son, born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He, our Lord Jesus, fulfilled all your will and won for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands in suffering in order to free from suffering those who trust you. He is the one who handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death to break the bonds of the evil one, to crush hell underfoot, to give light to the righteous, to establish his covenant, and to show forth the resurrection, taking bread, giving thanks to you, said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, his ascension and his giving of the Holy Spirit, we take this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. Send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. Please stand. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite anyone that would like to receive prayer and anointing to meet me in the front.
give you the spirit of truth that you might understand in your innermost parts the love that he has for you in Christ Jesus. May the Lord lift up his face upon you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you. May the Lord give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, you are the body of Christ.